My field of study is anatomy. I teach pathology as it happens, but anatomy is my training. And my interest is because New Zealand had a very high rate of circumcision and it seemed to be a very anomalous practice to me uh, personally and, and collectively. So I got a bit curious, as most boys do, as to, as to why this was happening. And I began quite studying it quite early in my life, as it happens. And the more I looked into it, the more anomalous and senseless it seemed to be. It didn't seem to have a medical or uh, purpose to it, if I guess. I guess the best way to put it. So that is the background to my to my studies. Well, we we have to use histological methods. Now, histology is a branch of pathology which looks at tissue in its natural form. Uh, it comes from the Greek meaning uh, a, a web or net or fabric. And uh, so you, you slice tissue up into very thin slices, put on slides, and look at it under the microscope to interpret the architecture of the cells, how they're lined up. And most people are familiar with the, the general pictures of how the skin is arranged and so on, and that's, that's how it's done. Uh, and you have to then take your two-dimensional images that you see on the microscope and build up a three-dimensional image of it. Things have progressed, of course, considerably in recent years. We can now, uh, using computer technology and confocal microscopes, we can allow the microscope to do that and build absolutely exquisite three-dimensional pictures of tissues. Well, the thing that struck me about it was the similarity with the fingertip, with the high level of innovation, lots of, lots of sensory tissue, and the fact that it... Uh, was far more complicated than just a simple extension of the shaft skin of the penis, which is what most people say it is, that it's a flap extended over the glands to protect the glands. It is not. Uh, I would regard it as an organ in its own right because it has at least two major functions. The first function is, is mechanical. It provides uh, a rolling bearing on the penis, which you wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, it also provides the, the uh, extra tissue required for expansion. It sort of changes of size. The penis does get bigger, and if the skin was, was uh, uh, a fixed size, then uh, a good deal of discomfort would result in a huge amount of stretching to accommodate the doubling in size that occurs with erection. So the, the, the foreskin provides accommodation, I guess is the word we would use to describe changes in size. The second major function is its sensory function. Uh, it has become very evident to us over the last 15 years or so. I'm trying to think when uh, John Taylor and his team came out with their findings in the early 90s, that, that the realisation has come upon us, even if uh, people didn't stop to think about what they were feeling themselves if they were intact. I certainly didn't. I didn't really sit down to an analyse uh, what I was feeling. Uh, but the microscope disclosed to us that uh, the foreskin is heavily sensory in its function. Uh, I, I would believe, what it, well, it is my belief, that, that it has the highest concentration of sensory nerve endings anywhere on the male body. So it can't be ignored, it can't be described as a simple piece of skin. Males and females uh, develop from the same embryological tissue. They, they, they have two possible pathways that that tissue can develop in and males go down one path and uh, under the influence of testosterone and females go down the other without testosterone. And yes, uh, most embryologists would say that there, there are distinct an uh, analogues between the two. Uh, the labial tissues, for instance, are said to be the analogue of the scrotum and of course the penis itself has its analogue in the clitoris. Uh, the foreskin has its analogue also in the, in the female. There is a female foreskin, the clitoral hood. Um, the difference is that, uh, and this is one of the great mysteries of, of anatomy, is that the male is, has the uh, nerve endings arranged differently in the female to the male. And it is the human male that is extraordinarily unique. We, we do not uh, even have the same arrangement as other primates. Chimpanzee, for instance, our nearest, nearest uh, cousins, if you will, uh, do not have the same nerve arrangement on the penis that we do. It's the reverse, in fact. Uh, 
So human, uh, humans have developed a penis that's utterly unique. And, and the thing that fascinates me is that it's been done in such a short period of time, about four and a half to five million years of evolution, which is but in the blink of an eye. So there are great mysteries with, with the human penis. The specialised sensory tissue that I've been describing is, is really quite fascinating. The skin of the penis is zipped up, just, just like an ordinary zip, uh, on the underside, as the, as the layers of cells develop in the, in the embryo, and that we call the raphe, that little line, that, the seam which goes up. And, and at the top of the penis, it becomes the little bridge, uh, the frenulum, which is Latin meaning a little bridle, actually. Frenum is a bridle, a horse's bridle, and a frenulum is a little bridle. And that tethers the foreskin onto the base of the glands on the underside. Now, for many years, people thought that that was the only real specialization that had occurred, that it was a, a leftover of this process of zipping all the skin up as it was developed. But now we realize that this, this amazing concentration of, of, of nerve endings is related to that frenulum, and from the frenulum, uh, draping away to each side, is a band of, of um, ridges, f uh, folds in the skin, which uh, John Taylor has, has called the ridged band. There are about uh, 11 or 12 ridges, and they are very similar to the ridges on the fingers, on the fingertip, and they run right round, uh, right round the entire uh, diameter of the penis and rise up into the frenulum, and they enclose in the inner foreskin a, a delta, a, a triangle of, of skin, uh, which we've called the frenular delta, uh, below the frenulum, which is exquisitely innovated, and most men know this as their own G spot, the, the spot that is the most sensitive area of the penis. Now, in those, in, in that area, in the ridged band and in the frenular delta, we have the same specialist nerve endings that we have in the fingertip, only we have probably ten times as many, I, I would believe. The number hasn't been accurately counted yet, but. Uh, the, the number of nerve bundles that, that uh, wire them up is known, and it's very impressive. So the foreskin is undoubtedly the main sensory unit of the penis. When it is removed, you remove at least 50% of the sensory capacity. So the effect is devastating to, to the, um, what I say, the, uh, uh, the, the sexual capacity of the organ. This has well, been well known for centuries. So it's, it's a fascinating organ from the neurological point of view. Uh, and this, this arrangement, this specialised arrangement, is why you cannot regard the foreskin as just ordinary skin. It isn't. It's highly specialised. And therefore, because of the two functions that I've mentioned, it is an organ in its own right. Well, circumcision, uh, by its very nature, not only removes 50% of the skin of the penis, because 50% of the skin is involved in the foreskin. It's, it's a substantial piece of skin, uh, the size of an index card, effectively, in the adult. And um, uh, that amount of skin uh, that's removed includes all of the ridge band and most of the frenulum of the delta. The frenulum may or may not be removed. Some surgeons believe it's a nuisance and should be extirpated, as they say, uh, wiped out, and others would leave it alone. And those that leave it alone leave some of the frenular delta behind and therefore some of the G-spot. But those that, that completely destroy it um, take away all of the, of the specialised sensory tissue. Now that uh, large number of nerve bundles that supply uh, those nerve endings are cut through and then you would have the standard uh, response of cut axons in or wires in, in the neural system and the sensory neurons, their cell bodies which are at the, at the position on the cord, they're, they're at the cord itself, the spinal cord, they then have to try and do some sort of damage control. If you cut a, uh, an area of your skin and you cut through some uh, nerve bundles, 
then the nerve cells will attempt to rebridge and go back to where they were originally, and there's a, a well-known and well-characterized process for that happening. And they will send out growth cones from the stump and, and seek where they were originally connected. The downstream portion of the, of the nerve from the cut will of course be disconnected from the cell and therefore its support and it becomes necrotic and, and is cleaned up by the immune system and taken away. Now in the, in the case of something like the foreskin where you have chopped out a major piece of skin, the, the, the target area, in other words the nerve endings, that those wires that the axons had originally gone to have now been removed so they cannot find where their original end point was. So the growth cones go out, they, they come up against the scar tissue which they cannot penetrate and they then either die back completely or they get into a knot of, of growth cones and all that can transmit is, is pain. And they're known as neuroma of uh, pain neuroma of scar tissue. Now circumcision removes 50% of the skin surface, so of well, the skin of the penis. And unfortunately, the most important part of the skin, the, the, the functional end, not the base where it doesn't matter. And it also removes something greater than 50% of the sensory nerve endings. Uh, and because they're concentrated in the frenular band and delta, which is automatically destroyed in circumcision, you, we're probably safer to think that it's probably closer to 75-80% of the sensory tissue is lost. Now, the, the functional effect of that is that the sensory drive into the spinal cord and up into the central nervous system is then greatly reduced. So not only does the man not feel too much sensation, and as a friend uh, and colleague of mine says, um, many circumcised men do not know where their orgasm is. They, cannot, they, they don't have enough pre-orgasmic sensation to, re to, to know how the, the rise of sensation is proceeding and an orgasm in many of these men comes upon them by surprise, more or less. And then uh, the pain and temperature, the very simple um, protective and rather unpleasant sensation that comes from the glands when it's at rest is turned off by this drive from the foreskin because of inhibitory endoneurons in the spinal cord. So that, in other words, when you have enough cascade of sensation driving into the cord, it, it sets off inhibitory interneurons which turn off and inhibit the, in, the input from the glands. So men don't feel anything from the glands because they wouldn't want to. So what happens then in the circumcised man? When, when orgasm occurs and the foreskin sensory drive begins to tail off, it loses, it, there isn't enough of it, there's less than 50% of it of course, there isn't enough of it to maintain the in inhibition of the glands and suddenly they feel uh, the most unpleasant sensation of the glands and they want instant stop of motion. Um, they've either withdrawn from their female partner or they, if they're still inserted, they, they say, for heaven's sake, stop, don't move, you know, I can't bear it. And this is a very common feature in circumcised men. And it must be devastating for their partners to, to suddenly have this disconnect of, of what should be the most joyous moment. Um, and it's always been a a difficulty for me to understand exactly what's been going on, but this is how we, we believe that, it, that, that this, um, that there's a term for it, um, dyspareunia is, is one of the terms, uh, pain, pain of intercourse, and it's almost invariably confined to circumcised men. It does appear in intact men when the foreskin is, is not as mobile as it should be, they get it a bit tangled up. when they're saying that is that they're talking of the sensation that's coming from the glands and the glands does not have the neural equipment to send fine touch what we call fine touch sensation it only sends free nerve ending uh, sensation like in fact its nearest equivalent is the cornea of the eye you don't like stroking the cornea of the eye at all uh, but if you have an eyelash get under the eyelid, you know it's there, but you don't know exactly where it is, and it's dreadfully upsetting, and you want to go and get it cleared. That is what the glands produces. It doesn't, you don't know exactly where it is, because it's not actually a high-resolution system. 
um, but it's very unpleasant, and that gets turned off when when a man is 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 in the pre-ejaculatory or pre-orgasmic phase. So uh, we've got a mechanism, in other words, in, in normal intact men, for taking away this protective sensation when you don't need it during sexual intercourse. Uh, but in circumcised men, it returns at the wrong moment. Well, the natural end of this, to avoid nerve damage and the loss of sensation and, and a lifetime of erotic uh, pleasure and uh, the avoidance of this peculiar pain effect and so on is not to cut them in the first place, just leave it alone. Um, and, and of course, evolution has actually figured the right pathway. Boys are being born every minute and second of the day complete with foreskins and they're going to continue to be born with foreskins.